All right, welcome to the Wilmer Public Library. It is an exciting day to be out and about in our community, especially because we have a couple critters and we have Alex from the Minnesota Zoo. You are a naturalist. Uh, tell us about the Zoomobile and uh, all the exciting events that you go to and all the different animals. Sure. You know, the Zoomobile is a part of the education department at the zoo. And what we do is travel the state, I mean, the whole state and sometimes other states, and do educational programs with these live animals. So typically, we are out on the road every day throughout the year year even in the winter time and we go to places like the libraries like here at Wilmer or we'll go to a, pro a lot of schools uh, churches um, fairs any kind of event except for usually a private home that's very good and you're out promoting uh, actually all life and you get to show the live animals and the kids get to see it and the parents because I know the parents are excited I'm excited this is the third time I've been <laughs> to see you guys yeah. and it's a lot of fun Yes, we're out there doing, you know, promoting good environmental education, how to be good um, ambassadors for animals and good environmental stewardship, you know, how to take care of this world that we live in and make good choices, even just dispelling myths about animals that we might encounter daily. And then, you know, their job isn't out there to scare us. You know, a lot of us don't like snakes and creepy crawlies, but they actually have a job where they help all of us out here, whether it's in Minnesota or down in the tropics or a whole nother continent. That's very good. I see our armadillo, armadillo is waking up just a little tiny yes. bit. Uh, he's a uh, second, second appearance that he's uh, made today. And you have another performance later. Uh, tell us about the armadillo. Sure. The armadillo is a South American armadillo. It's actually a three-banded armadillo. It has three bands on the back, one, two, and three. And they kind of stretch across like a Band-Aid. And the cool thing about the three-banded armadillo is it's the only type of armadillo that can roll up in a ball. So it doesn't roll in a ball to go anywhere, but just to kind of so close up and protect its soft underside. And these these guys, you know, we talk about their importance in their ecological niche, and theirs is eating insects and kind of balancing that out in nature. So, you know, insects are great, they're wonderful pollinators, but too many of them can be a problem. And so this is our natural balance, is having animals like the armadillo in South America, or here you've got bats that so will eat mosquitoes and lots of other insects too. So we just kind of relate how every animal has a job, whether you like them and think they're kind of cool like this one, or maybe it's not so cool looking to you, but that it's really important out there. And because I was a very good listener, I know that these uh, live to be about 15 years old, correct? Correct, that is. Good. Uh, I, that's the test today. Thank you, I know. Well, it, it's so much fun. You know, you get to come out and you see the kids' eyes, and, and like I said, the parents' eyes, that when they see these different uh, creatures uh, that, you know, some of them are abandoned, some of them are actually born at the zoo, right? Correct. You know, for most of our animals, we try to get them from breeders, just as you would for like a cat or a dog. We have zoo breeders or other zoos and aquariums, and we'll trade them. A lot of times, some animals wouldn't have been able to survive on their own, and so they work out really well, especially to get them young, so that they're used to traveling traveling in groups like this and then we have a training process with that so that they feel comfortable whether we're at a school or in a gym or here at a library in a meeting room and they're out there and about and some of them are even touchable. <laughs> That's right. And it, it feels like a cantaloupe. Ooh, almost yes. scared me there for yeah. a second. That's what you talk about when your presentation. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's getting people aware of the different uh, animals that live uh, with us and uh, all, all over the different, because there's how many different places do we have that we talked about today that we have animals from? Uh, you know, today I had a couple of animals from South America in different parts of South America. I had one that you could find on every continent, a peregrine falcon. So it's for Antarctica, one from Africa, and then of course so we had to bring one from home, so one from Minnesota too. Right. I think uh, the millipede was uh, really neat. It was it's it's a very large, even though it wasn't <laughs> as big as you think it was. But that is a real big creature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're really neat. I love to bring them. I mean, people are like, wait, that's not a big animal, but it has a huge job in nature as nature's recycler. And it's also nice too, just to kind of talk about, you know, everybody worries about animals and safety or what can it do. And that's one of the times I can rarely say that an animal won't bite, jump, sting, or fly, and that it's completely harmless and totally helps us out. Well, it's so interesting. Every uh, year when you guys uh, come out, I know I saw you in Spicer one time. And uh, if someone is interested in having the zoo and the Zoomobile and you or one of the naturals come out, what do they need to do? You know, um, you can check us out if it's easy to go to the mnzoo.org, our website, and there's tabs for education, and Zoomobile has its own tab. Otherwise, you can call us directly at the zoo at our 952-431-9228. That's our Zoomobile scheduling line, and we're open seven days a week. You know, if we're not out programming, we're back taking care of the animals in our collection, so we're always there. 
Well, that's great. And I did print the map out because I didn't, uh, I, I have, it's been a while since I've been there, but there are so many things you have going on. You have the, the family farm, uh, you have the amphitheater, you have Discovery Bay, you have uh, the Environmental Education Center, and also the Learning Center where you can see penguins and gray wolves and beaver and monkeys and sea otters and sharks and bears and moose and caribou. And there's just so many things to do. And so we want to encourage people to get out and take a look at the zoo. This is just a little tiny 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 portion of what you can see when you're there yeah it is and you know with what we saw today with the bonus of that is if you've been to the zoo before these are animals that live behind the scenes at the zoo so they get to rest when they're at the zoo and they're out and about but we do have animals like an um, armadillo out on exhibit too just a different one from the zoo and yeah you know we're open 363 days out of the year so even in the cold winter you can come and escape in our tropics building and there's plenty of inside stuff to do but our outside trails are open all year long too you know in the September We've got Brew at the Zoo coming up. So we've got events not only for families, but also for just adults only, too. So we're a place for everybody. It's true. And, and you get a chance, do uh, go out and, and take a look at it. It's in Apple Valley. And uh, again, if you want more information, the best thing to do, it's the easiest way, um, mnzoo.org. mnzoo.org. I almost forgot. Important. It's important. But, you know, and one thing I found out, too, when I was looking on the website, you can actually bring a picnic basket and you can have some food out there. There's picnic tables around the whole grounds and it's a lot of fun yeah you can bring your own treats for you or your family to do there's treats on site as well but yeah make a whole day of the event you know you can leave the zoo you can restamp yourself and come back in later if you wanted to make a day of it in the cities there all right it's a good plan we got to get our little armadillo back so he can or she he or she uh today i think i brought the uh, mail okay. i did bring the mail okay it's the mail so that's probably why he's not like if it was the female, it would just be relaxing, right? Right. Oh, either of them, they're, they're both the same, aren't they? Actually, are they? Are one more active than the other? He is more active. I don't know if it's because if it's a male or if it's just him. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to say it's a male. So that's why he's just crazy, busy doing whatever he's doing. So, all right. More information, mnzoo.org. You're watching Do You Know? Hi, Jody Wambeck with the Wilmer Early Childhood Initiative and Early Childhood Family Programs. By now you should have all received your Wilmer Community Ed and Rec brochure in the mail. There is something for everyone in there, so be sure to check that out. And if you have children, be sure to look at our Cardinal Place program that offers before and after school care. And if you have young children, our preschool program options are in there as well. And of course, our Early Childhood Family Education classes will be starting mid-September, so be sure to check those out as well. And kind of mark your calendars. We have our WOW events, and remember, WOW stands for World of Wonder. We have our first one in September at Jefferson Learning Center. And then our October one, which is the fire station event, that will be held Monday, October 13th. So please mark your calendar for that. So again, Wilmer Community Ed and Rec brochure, check it out. There's lots in there. You are watching Do You Know? I'm Renee Nolting from United Way of West Central Minnesota, and September is a very exciting time at your local United Way. The week of September 9th, we're kicking off the 2014-2015 campaign, and we look forward to connecting with people in the community throughout the process. You'll see brochures go in the mail, and we're very excited this year to have Sarah and Gabe Claussen as our campaign chairs. They'll be out and about in the community with us, reaching out to employers and helping us to generate donations for the work that we do. You know, uh, this last year I have to say I am very excited about the work that we did in education. We are advancing the bar in early ed with the things that we do with the Wilma Early Childhood Cabinet. Our Gromobile program has reached more kids than ever with the programming and we've really reached out to diverse populations. We are going to be funding 40 programs this, this coming year because of donors and we're very grateful for that. And I don't know if you know this, but you know, education is not just about having pencils and paper and having scholarship for kids. It's about the whole well-being. United Way is focused on that. We want to make sure that every child comes to school prepared, comes to school that's not hungry, has a roof over their head, and has all those basic things that help make them a whole person. I don't know if you know this, but in the Minnesota State Student Survey last year, in the fifth grade class in Wilmer alone, 
14 children indi indicated out of 100 that they skipped a meal because their family didn't have the resources to provide that meal. You know, that's just a little piece of what United Way is about. It's about making lasting change and making a difference. I want to invite you to join us this year by giving, advocating, and volunteering. And I have to tell you about our video. We have a, a really wonderful video out for this campaign with the help of Tori Noring. It is on our website, www.liveunitedwcm.org. And what the video does, it connects the dots. It was um, kind of called reality TV, I guess, where we brought people that had gotten services from United Way programming and brought them to meet someone who had been a donor. And what came out of it is just, for me, it was very heartwarming. Um, I don't get that often a chance to see those folks and uh, hear their stories. And let me tell you, it's all because of donors. And I thank you so much for your support and hope that you will live united with us during this campaign. This is Did You Know? I'm Zach Liebel, Outreach Coordinator for the Wilmer Community-Owned Grocery. This month, I would like to share some information about our member investment campaign. Many organizations, whether in startup or expansion phases, rely on capital campaigns where those interested and supportive make a donation to the organization. However, the COG is taking a different approach. We are conducting a member investment campaign. Only the member owners of the COG will be allowed to make this investment. The COG will be offering our members the opportunity to help us raise our capital by buying additional shares in the COG or by giving the COG a member loan. If a member owner is able to take advantage of either of these opportunities, they will be helping the COG open sooner and they will be helping themselves out by making a financial investment into a business they are already part owner of. For more information on the COG and becoming a member owner, please visit www.wilmercog.com. I'm Zach Liebel and you're watching Do You Know. Good morning, this is Susan Matson. Candy Ojai County Master Gardener. And I'm here this morning with Tiemann Miller, who has grown some remarkable tomato plants over the summer. And I would like to have Tiemann talk a little bit about why he chose these plants and also why he, uh, or what kind of um, service he's been giving to the plants because they are absolutely beautiful and lush. They also have some large tomatoes on them. So I'm going to turn this over to Tiemann right now, but I'll, I'll ask him a couple questions first. Um, Tiemann, what made you decide to grow tomatoes this summer? Um, well, I really like tomatoes, and um, I don't know. Uh, my grandma's really into gardening, too, so she kind of got me into it. And where did you get your tomato plants and pots and uh, the potting soil? I got it all at Gertens. In, in Minneapolis. I think you can probably get almost all kinds in Wilmer for those of you that live in Wilmer. But um, Gertens is an excellent choice. Probably have a few more choices there. And so tell us about the, the different varieties that you bought. Um, I bought a Early Girl, a Purple Cherokee, and I bought a Beef Master. And I bought them because they usually do well in this type of area. And um, to get a good tomato plant you really have to pay attention to I mean, what grows best in the area because, I mean, some are different. And you put them in a good spot where they probably get almost full sun all day. So you, do you know a little bit more about the conditions that tomatoes grow best in? Um, just a lot of sun 
and I mean watering them well mm -hmm. and making sure that you have um, good fertilizer and I don't know just kind of checking up on them. So how, how I know that typically it's important to feed tomatoes when you first plant them with a, like osmocote or a long range plant food but then also it's suggested that you plant uh, give them a plant food every other week so what did you use? Um, I used to make Tomato Maker 426, and I got that at Gertens as well. Sounds good. I've never tried it, but it looks like it did a good job. So we have three different varieties. Um, have you had a chance to taste any yet? Um, yeah, I've tried the um, Purple Cherokee, and they are really, really good. So. And I also have Purple Cherokee, and they are one of the best tomatoes I think I've ever had. So uh, why don't you just take a few minutes and, and show us a little bit about the tomatoes that you've planted here? Okay, um, well, this is the early girl, and I don't know, I think it's the smallest out of all of them. Um, I don't know. Uh, this is the purple Cherokee, or Cherokee purple, and this is doing the best, I think. Um, I don't know. Uh, I put eggs, this, this white stuff right here is eggshells, and that really um, helps prevent blossom and rot, which is uh, kind of like a... Um, a thing at the bottom of the plant that kind of just like, I don't know, makes it rot and not do very well. Um, and then right here, I have the Beef Master, and it's kind of falling over. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. It's well, Timon, I think you've done a wonderful job. I'm always glad to see younger gardeners get started especially in our county where it's not always possible to um, to get interested in gardening when you're that young. So this is, um, I'll sign off right now, we're headed over to the fair where we're going to check out the Master Gardener booth and display. Uh, their theme this year is Leap into Gardening. There are, I believe, eight scarecrows there which are on display for people to view and to uh, actually rate and judge. So with that in mind, we'll take off for the fair. This is Susan Matson, Master Gardener for Candy High County with Becky West. And we are at the booth at the fair for the Horticulture Society as well as the Master Gardeners. Our theme this year is Leap into Gardening. So if you look around, you will see all kinds of frogs that are part of the display. Um, I'd like to have Becky tell a little bit about her part of, in this. Um, there's all kinds of interesting things to see here. Becky? Well, my, my part is to organize the scarecrows and um, leap into gardening is just a fun theme that we have seen uh, exhibited in many, many different kinds of scarecrows today. But the purpose of the garden is to have many different kinds of flowers and also to allow people to bring their gardening questions to us. We can't always answer them uh, 
but we certainly will try and we will, uh, if a question comes up that is really important, we'll try to answer it ahead of time. There are a lot of interesting things here for both gardeners and non-gardeners. Um, so let's go and check them out. Joe and Roger Holm brought straw bales uh, to the fair this year. Straw bale gardening has become really popular in the last few years. Um, it's a bit complicated. You do need to have the bales watered down uh, so that they are uh, in really good condition for gardening. Uh, Joe and Roger have in their display some cabbage, it looks like kohlrabi, uh, tomatoes, and a few marigolds. So that's a very unusual um, and also a very unique way of doing the straw bale gardening. They have it put together with boards and ropes. Right now we're looking at the begonia tree and Daryl has information about that. The begonia tree is from Marvin Patton. He's a former owner of a greenhouse in Granite Falls. He currently lives in Clara City. And there are 25 begonias making up the tree. And the tree comes in four different parts so it can be disassembled for movement. All right. This is my favorite. This one says, frog parking only, all others will be towed. And we have um, tires that are part of the body of the frog. We have some unusual eyes that are made up of pots. And then we have some little slippers that are the little feet on the, uh, on the ground. So with that, we're going to be leaving the fair for Do You Know? See you next month. It is Do You Know, and joining us on the telephone is Jody Breiker from the Affiliated Community Medical Center's Health Learning Center. Today, Joe, we're talking about triclosan. An ingredient in an antibacterial soap has been making the headlines across Minnesota in recent months. Antibacterial products may help kill germs, but do they really reduce your risk of getting sick or passing on germs to others? Is it really any better than good old soap and water? If recent research is any indication than no, no, and no. Potential health hazards related to triclosan are, are to be thought of. In the past, it was thought that there were a number of health benefits to products with triclosan, an antimicrobial agent and pesticide in consumer sanitizing, and hand and body cleansing products. The more we learn, the more concerned we have become about the use of this product. There are a number of contributing factors that led to Minnesota's recent ban on triclosan. Triclosan is commonly found in nearly 2,000 different products, ranging from antibacterial soaps. The FDA estimates 75% of all antibacterial liquid soaps and body washes sold in the United States have them, to toothpaste, dishwashing detergents, and even cosmetics. How do I know if, if my antibacterial soap has triclosan in it? According to the FDA, antibacterial soaps, also known as antimicrobial or antiseptic soaps, may contain chemical ingredients like triclosan, which is not found in plain soap. These ingredients are added to reduce or prevent bacterial contamination. Most bacterial products are clearly labeled, just look for the word, antibacterial. However, a drug fact sheet on soap and body wash is a sure sign the product has antibacterial ingredients like triclosan. Though studies have not sh yet shown triclosan to be hazardous to humans, they've raised other concerns. The studies have shown triclosan may way, alter the way hormones work in the body and could potentially contribute to making bacteria resistant to antibiotics in lab animals. If the same were to tr prove true to people, this could have long-term effects on how we treat people needing antibiotics. The University of Minnesota also published a study that found higher levels of triclosan in the sediment of area lakes. It is thought that these chemicals could break down in those waters, potentially resulting in a harmful dioxins, which may cause adverse side effects when it comes to your health, including cancer. 
Although dioxin-related side effects depend on the level of exposure, when you're exposed and how frequently you're exposed, the potential health effects are concerning. These factors and others led Minnesota's triclosan ban, which is scheduled to take place in 2017. Until the government knows more, you're better off saying goodbye to pricey antibacterial soaps and get up back to the basics. Break out the old-fashioned soap and water. Joe, very good information to keep in mind. If you have any health-related questions that affect you or your family, feel free to call ACMC's Health Learning Center at 231-5070. Thanks, Joe. We'll talk to you next month. Thanks, Rudy. Now joining us on the other line is Kathy Torkelson from the Wilmer Public Library. Kathy, a lot of things happening this month. Give us all the details. Hi, Rudy. It's hard to believe school is starting. We've had a busy summer here at the library at the summer reading program. Now we are ready to start our fall programs. Have you ever wondered why books are banned and why? Banned Book Week is September 21st through the 27th. And it's a national event celebrating the importance of reading and the freedom of the First Amendment. It was first launched in 1982 in response to an increase in the number of books challenged by schools, libraries, and bookstores. For our September Book Club, we are reading the book Bridge to Terabithia by Katherine Patterson. This is one of the books that is on the banned or controversial list. This book, we will uh, discuss the book, and then we'll watch the movie. The movie is uh, about Jesse Aarons, who is a fifth grader, and he's trained all summer to become the fastest runner in the school. He becomes upset when his new classmate, Leslie Berkey, outruns him and everyone else. Despite this and some other striking differences, the two become fast friends. Together, they create Terabithia, where they rule as king and queen, and is a land filled with monsters, trolls, ogres, and giants. This friendship helps Jesse cope with a tragedy that makes him realize what Leslie has taught him. For our children's matinee, we are going to be showing the movie How to Eat Fried Worms. And this movie is based on the book by Thomas Rockwell. Could you imagine eating 10 worms in one day? That's what Billy goes up against against when he meets the school bully on the first day of school. As the pressure mounts, Billy must summon all his strength to meet the dare, all the while keeping his weak stomach from betraying him and his big mouth from getting him in even more trouble. So those two um, books and movies should be really fun for the children to um, read and come and watch. We will also be starting Story Hour 2 at the end of September. So if your children like to hear stories, do finger plays, and do arts and crafts, this would be a good time to bring them to the library. This program will be for ages two and a half to six years of age. And it's never too early for babies and toddlers to listen to stories and finger plays and music. Baby Lapsit will be starting up again, too, this fall. And that program is for ages six to two and a half years old. And once a month, we will be doing Bringing Stories to Life with Early Childhood. At this story hour, we each will read a story and we have lots of crafts and activities for the children to participate in. As always, lots of things going on at the library. If you want more information on these activities or any of the other programs at the Wilmer Public Library, feel free to call 235-3162 or you can check it out online at wilmerpubliclibrary.org. Thanks, Kathy. We'll talk to you next month. Thanks, Rudy. This has been Do You Know?